Twenty more seconds. <laughs> so let's get started with the next presentation of uh, today. Uh, there are a couple of new people here since uh, the presentation this morning. So welcome to uh, the Challenge Lab. Yesterday we had five presentations. Today we have three more. This is the second one. And uh, you, uh, Luis and Amanda, you get uh, you have 30 minutes to present. I'll let you know after five minutes, uh, after 25 minutes. And then we have 10 minutes of opposition. And after the opposition, there will be room for questions from the audience. But uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, we want to start by saying hi and a very warm welcome, everyone. It's good and a bit strange to see so many familiar faces. <laughs> My name is Luis, and this is Magdalena. And we are both students from the master's program Industrial Design Engineering. And for the past five months, we have combined our knowledge in sustainability and design to make research more available for practical use. And in this work, we've had two different focuses. So on the one side, we've looked into a research model called UMAN, which is short for the Urban Metabolism Analyst. So trying to understand its potential and how it can be used. And on the other side, we've looked into one potential user of this model, so trying to understand their needs and how the model can be adapted to better fit their work. And so during this half hour, you will hear more about our process of moving from understanding these two focuses into suggesting concrete ways of visualizing relevant data from the model. And for the agenda today, we'll start by going through a bit about the scope. We'll then go uh, forward to the two focuses, so the UMAN model and the case study of the potential user. We'll then uh, show you a few highlights from the design process before moving into our final suggestions for how to present the relevant UMAN data. So, uh, already in December last year, actually, we heard about this model, the Urban Metabolism Analyst, that can be used as a tool by local authorities when transitioning from a linear to a circular economy. There was and is, however, still an issue with the model because the data in it is so extensive and so complex that it's quite difficult to apply practically. And so with our background in design, we saw an opportunity to make a change here. So we set out to adapt this model for more practical use by applying a user-centered and collaborative approach that we are familiar with from the design field. And we wanted to anchor the development of the model in specific user needs by looking into the case study of circular garden work that we will come back to in a minute. So our aim was uh, initially to work closely with both the Uman research team as well as circular garden work to investigate what types of use that could be relevant for the model as well as how the relevant data could be visualized in an intuitive and user-friendly way. And before we move forward to the UMAN model, we need to put it in a bit of a perspective by talking about a few theoretical concepts that lay behind it. And we'll start from the broad concept of circular economy. So, uh, circular economy is an economic system where resources are seen as only parts of products that loop back into the system when they are no longer in use. So instead of a linear take make waste economy that we have today, the approach of a circular economy is rather take, make, use, reuse, remanufacture, and so on. And it's aiming to achieve change within any system. Uh, you have to start by understanding what the system looks today. So if aiming for a circular city, uh, it's important to first understand what resources 
resources that you have within the city so that you can find the preferred way to economize with, uh, with these resources. And this brings us to the concept of urban metabolism. And urban metabolism looks upon cities as living organisms where water, energy and material comes into the city, transforms within the city and then at some stage might leave the city. And this concept or rather way of analyzing a city gives an understanding of what and how, how much resources uh, that come into the city and how they are consumed and how they affect each other and uh, finally how they exit. Uh, so in short it gives an understanding of the flows that you have in the city. And in this thesis we are fo uh, focusing specifically on materials. And a common method to compre comprehensively estimate and map uh, material flows is material flow accounting or MFA. And MFA provides, uh, provides data of the flows and stocks of material that you have uh, within a system and can be used to identify opportunities where flows can be made uh, more efficient. And today this type of data is mainly used on a national level, uh, but not so much on a regional level. <clears throat> okay, so now that you have a bit of theoretical context, let's move forward to the urban metabolism analyst model. So the Uman model, which is currently being developed here at Chalmers, was created to provide overviews of flows on an urban level. And it accounts for flows of materials, as well as approximately a thousand product types. And all flows are measured in terms of mass. So the metric we're looking at here is tons. And uh, work is right now being done to combine this data with life cycle assessments or LCA profiles. And this means that you can get information not only about the mass of a flow, but also its environmental impact. And when we talk about environmental impact here, it's not just greenhouse gases or climate change. It's also acidification, eutrophication, photochemical ozone formation, and resource utilization. Um, and so Uman provides uh, region-specific data on flows that can aid local authorities in a number of ways. Uh, it can, for instance, uh, display information about critical flows that are either being consumed a lot or have high environmental impact. And this, in turn, can be a support in knowing which flows to target when moving from a linear to a circular economy, for instance. And since data exists for several years, it can also show trends in consumption behavior, uh, which then can be used to predict future challenges within resource use. Uh, Uman also provides data for more specific or more detailed queries uh, and can, for instance, show the interrelations and interdependencies with other areas uh, or region when it comes to imports and exports. Uh, it can show uh, what economic sectors that are responsible for the consumption of a certain flow. And it can also show, for instance, how extensive a system intervention would need to be in order to have significant effect on the system. However, at the moment, this more detailed data is still quite rough. So now we will move into our case study. And we have anchored our work in one potential user of the Uman data called Circular Gothenburg. And Circular Gothenburg is a project with, uh, within Gothenburg municipality uh, that aims to make the transition towards a uh, circular economy happening faster. And they do this by developing practices to use resources more uh, efficiently, mainly within the municipal organization, but also in Gothenburg as a whole. Uh, the aim is to move upwards in the waste hierarchy, meaning to direct the focus towards uh, prevention and reuse rather than recycling. Uh, and their work is very practical. They meet multiple actors, do workshops, uh, establish initiatives that support both citizens but also organizational actors uh, in becoming more circular in, in their resource use. And the work of Circular Gothenburg includes a number of activities. For instance, they're running several products at the same time. 
uh, which of course requires planning and prioritizing. Uh, the Circle of Gothenburg must plan what to do, how to do it, and what's close to target. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, in order to uh, achieve system change, you must first understand the system. Uh, and therefore, Circle of Gothenburg's work include a lot of uh, information gathering and analysis in order to, uh, as we say in here, scan the current state of the issues that they address. And to make circularity happen in practice, uh, they, they also need to identify and engage uh, actors from all over the municipal organizations, but also from the, from the city to initiate fruitful uh, collaboration. And with their work, they want to catalyze and achieve both environmental and social change. Uh, uh, and they do this by working with several actors and being uh, a role model for the municipality within their own resource use. And of course, they want to achieve as much as possible using as little resources as possible, uh, which calls for efficient uh, action plans. And the hardship that they currently face is lack of time, uh, difficulties in assessing the effects of their work, uh, difficulties in knowing how much they need to do to achieve a certain, uh, to achieve the desired effect, and difficulties in dividing roles and responsibilities within the collaboration that they have. Uh, and they would also benefit from more diverse input to the strategy work and to scan the current, current state. So with the understanding of these two focuses, we began a design process to adapt the UMAN model to the work of Circular Gothenburg. Um, and user-centered design approaches like the one we have applied in our thesis, they are often very needs-driven. And so the first step of our process was to map the needs of Circular Gothenburg. Um, these approaches they also view products from the perspective of the value that they bring. And so while mapping the needs of Circular Gothenburg, we also mapped the potential value of the Uman model. And to do these mappings, we took information from several different interviews that we've had, and we then applied the framework of the value proposition canvas. And the value proposition canvas consists of two parts. So on the left side in the circle, we have the customer profile, including the jobs or the tasks that the customers are carrying out, the gains that they want to achieve through those jobs, and the pains kind of hindering them from doing so. So for Circular Gothenburg, for instance, the job of collaborating across borders with multiple actors can uh, achieve the gain of reaching a big mass and a lot of people, but is currently uh, hindered or made more difficult by Pains related to dividing roles and responsibilities within those collaborations. Uh, the second part of the canvas, which is shown here, is the value map. And this includes the products and services that you provide, uh, the gain creators that you offer to your customers through these products and services, and the pain relievers that can sort of make your customers' lives a bit easier. So for the Uman case, uh, the kind of main product of displaying overviews of flows on an urban level uh, can, for instance, relieve the pain of not knowing where to start and which flows to focus on when, for instance, moving from a linear to a circular economy. And this can thereby enable the game creator of more effective and more efficient action plans and prioritization. Uh, but since we'll already talked a bit about what you can do with the human model and the work of Circular Gothenburg. We won't go into more depth about this, but instead we'll show you how we kind of translated needs and value into specific concepts. So <clears throat> in this initial stage of the design process, the idea that the human data should be presented through a software started to form. And it made a lot of sense to us since it would enable Circular Gothenburg to access data whenever they want it, and because the software also opens up for a much more interactive way of exploring data. So while we had absolutely no ambition at all to actually develop this, it's not at all our expertise, 
uh, we focused our continued design process on developing components that could be part of such a software. And these components then were developed based on the needs of Sophia Rothenberg and what you can do with the UNA model, either now or with future development of the model. And examples of such uh, components were overviews of flows on an urban level or city level, which we've talked about is basically the main product of the human model and could help Circular Gothenburg in, for instance, scanning the current state of the issues they address by adding a complementary perspective in this, in this work. Uh, overviews of the municipality's own consumption, uh, which could make it easier for Circular Gothenburg to address their specific critical flows. And this is enabled, for instance, by the possibility to view the actors that are connected to critical flows or any flow for that matter. And simulating and evaluating the effects of the work that Circular Gothenburg do, which could enable more efficient action plans. And all of the components that we came up with were visualized and then presented to both the UMAN research team as well as Circular Gothenburg in a joint workshop. And most visualizations were done using Sankey diagrams that you can see examples of here. <coughs> and Sankey diagrams are particularly <coughs> useful when displaying data on flows, since they show both the dispersion of the flow, <coughs> and sort of how it spreads, as well as the magnitude of the flow, which is indicated through the thickness of the different arrows. So the idea we had when creating these visualizations uh, was that they would be interactive and that the user would access information on different levels of detail by clicking into the different flows or clicking into these different gray boxes that are called gates in Sankey diagrams that the flows kind of go through. Uh, we also had an idea to use mileovers, as you can see examples of here and there to provide more detailed information about the different fractions of the boats. And this right image here shows our initial idea for how to present uh, environmental impacts. So by combining the mass of each flow with the environmental impact of the specific material or specific product you're looking at, the arrows turn green, yellow, or red, depending on the overall impact of of that flow or that fraction. And uh, in this joint workshop, we also evaluated all of the components and all of the visualizations and got feedback on both their content and intuitiveness. And some remarks that we got uh, were, for instance, that there was a desire to view flows separately, so not necessarily combined as we've done it in these images, that we should reduce and rename the a number, um, we need to reduce the number of gates to make them more relevant to the work of Circular Gothenburg. That we should include the perspective of circularity as well, visually. So actually show how materials and products are looped back into the system. Um, that we should consider times when this data or these diagrams need to be presented outside of the software. So for instance, in the presentation session and they need to be in an analog format on a paper print. And that we should consider changing the chart type or diagram type for environmental impact. So, uh, based on the feedback that we got from the UMA team and the circular data work, uh, we did an iteration of the proposed software components and updated the visualization. And now we're going to walk you, walk you through our final suggestions on how to present the UMAN, UMAN data to support Circular Gothenburg in, in their job. Uh, and we want to stress that these are suggestions on how you could do it, not necessarily how you should do it. Uh, yeah. So initially, the user needs to specify what set of data that they want to see. In this view, they can filter depending on whether they want to see the mass of flows or their environmental impact, whether the system boundaries should be on a national or a regional level, and whether the flows should be in terms of pro uh, final products or material. And after that, the user chooses which geographical 
area uh, and time frame that is of interest, and how many flows that should be shown at the same time. And if choosing to look at environmental impact, the, the user also gets to choose which environmental impact type that they want to be explained. So we see two examples here, one that where mass flows uh, is selected, and then you can choose one or multiple products, uh, and you can look at one year or multiple years, and here environmental impact is chosen instead, and then you choose the impact type, and you can also choose, instead of choosing specific products, you can also choose top five products that contribute most to this environmental impact. And if the user chooses to show the mass flow of a certain product type, they are presented to this kind of uh, diagram, the Sankey diagram that we told you about. And here you can see, uh, this is furniture, for example, and you see the total mass flows in, in that column. And you can see if the furnitures uh, are uh, newly produced and how much is reused uh, in the flow and also how much that it stays in stock. And the things that don't stay in stock, they go to consumption. Uh, and the consumption gates that you can see here is public, industry, and private. Uh, so you see how much of the furniture that go into these consumption sectors. And you can also see what happens at end of life uh, for the furniture. How much goes to waste and how much goes to recovery. That, so how much is looped back into the system. In this way, you get an overview of, of the uh, product flow. And if the user wants to save this uh, chart and maybe compare it to other charts uh, or use it in a presentation, they can also save the charts so that they can put them next to each other. Uh, but it is still possible to look at uh, multiple product, product types in the same diagram. Uh, and this way, the user can compare the magnitudes between the different, uh, the different products. In this case, it's the furniture, electronics, and food that is compared next to each other. And by clicking on the different gates that the flows go through, uh, the user can access more detailed information. So for instance, by clicking on public, the user can see the consumption uh, of the municipal organization separate from that of the regional county. And the same can be done for industry, which can give information about which business sectors are consuming certain products. Uh, and this can make it easier to identify actors that need to be engaged when targeting certain product flows. And you can also zoom into disposal to review what type of recovery that is being applied to a specific product flow. Uh, and this information can be valuable in the municipality strive to climb upwards in the waste hierarchy. And if the user chooses to view the environmental impact of a product, uh, they are presented to this, this view. And here they can choose a specific aspect of environmental impact. And for instance, show the top five products in the area that contribute most to this, this aspect. Mm -hmm. And these top, product, uh, uh, top five products are shown in a pie chart that displays the distribution of impact between them. So here, a photochemical ozone formation have been chosen and then you see the top five products contributing to this environmental impact and uh, together these contribute to 80 percent of the total impact in the region which is shown here and to put this in some perspective this is also compared to other areas if it's if it's a lot or if it's uh, not so much compared to other areas And in addition to the Sankey diagram, the user can access more detailed information and get help analyzing the data through, through this view. And here they see, for instance, the percentage of circularity in the system, how a specific flow contribute, uh, contributes to various aspects of environmental impact, uh, consumption trends, and environmentally significant products within the product type. So, uh, these components that we've showed you display initial ideas for how a software using UMA data could be visualized for better comprehension. 
And these visualizations aim to spur further ideas and further development and can hopefully constitute some kind of common framework for both the Uman research team as well as Circular Gothenburg that they can uh, relate to and discuss around since they've both been part of developing it. And we think that the best way uh, to make use of this material would be to use it as a foundation for further iterations together with potential customers, and this is very important. Uh, and some of the components that we've showed you uh, require more development of the human model before they can be realized. However, our suggestion would be to start building a software based on the existing data and then add functionality as the model evolves. So finally then, uh, did we achieve what we set out to do? Well, uh, we have applied a user-centered approach to explore, on the one hand, the needs of Circular Gothenburg, and on the other hand, the potential of the Uman model. Uh, we then bridged those two focuses in the creation of conceptual software components, and we've visualized those components in a way that we find intuitive and user-friendly. So, uh, yeah, we think <laughs> that we have achieved our goal. Um, and by starting to adapt the human model for more practical use, we hope to have played a small, but still a part in the contribution to a more circular city. And that was all for us. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
Well, I guess a lot of it could be done now. It's the more, like, because the thing is that the more detailed data you want to have, the less accurate the data will be. So right now, uh, if you want really, really detailed data or detailed queries, the data can provide information, but it's quite rough. So the question is, how useful would it be in, the, in a practical application? Uh, but I mean, the overviews of flows, the data is there already. Uh, so it's just a matter, I guess, of putting it into something like this. And I think it could be done in like a static, because this is very interactive and dynamic format. Uh, and in a static format, I guess it could be done today. You could do a psychic diagram for a specific flow uh, depending on the data today. So that could definitely and also, like, it doesn't have to take maybe five to ten years because it depends. Like, that is kind of to have everything in place that we have kind of discussed during this project. Uh, but you could also do a lot, like, just from a year, I guess you could have some kind of software, like a basic software that does some of these things or does it a bit rough. Uh, so you could, like, start with that, and that doesn't have to take ten years. You are discussing a bit in your report that it might not be Circular Gothenburg who is the right recipient to this software and to the data in the Uman model. Then who would you say is the better recipient? Who could be benefit from, from your software? Mm, kind of one of the conclusions that we have in the report is that um, the Uman model is more useful for helping and planning and prioritization, for example. So more like strategy work uh, rather than very practical applications. And so while Circular Gothenburg indeed do include um, strategy work, they also have a lot of very practical work where they, like the data they perhaps would need in those applications is very detailed. And therefore, at least as of now, they might not be the perfect customer, <laughs> or however you want to call it. So I guess that a party that is more focused on only strategy or more high level planning um, would benefit perhaps more or could perhaps use it to a, a greater extent right now. Uh, Which we think would be like the other one. Like uh, administration that kind of decides which products are going to be financed. they could benefit a lot from this overview of, of the system. So I guess that's more based on how the data is now. Yeah. That it's it's more high level of sort of the broad overview now. But if it would be able to provide better detailed data, uh the government would be um Connecting to that is you're also um, that yes you you only or it seems like you were only in contact with Circular Gothenburg during this process and at the same time you realize that it might not be the right receiver so who else could you have involved and what do you think would have happened. What what made your uh, what made you decide to only look at one actor, and what could have been consequenced by looking at other actors? Yeah. <laughs> I think that if we would have widened the scope and looked at multiple actors, then we would have risked not landing in concrete solutions, because then we would have like a lot of needs to consider, and they they, they want this, they want, this. Uh, and then it's really hard to land in something concrete. And I think that was really what was necessary here to like be able to show something, some concrete functions, and then you can always alter them when it comes to other customers. But you have something to start with that you can uh, go from. And that was sort of our aim in the beginning that we wanted to land in something very concrete. And there was kind of a collaboration going on already between the research team and Circuit So. It, it was very natural for us to work with them. Yeah. 
I guess we would have landed perhaps in, in less detailed results, uh, but perhaps a better overview of the needs, which could be useful in further development. So for the next iteration, who should be involved? I think it, it depends a bit on sort of where the model wants to go or where the research team want to go with the model. If, if the aim will still be to, to provide this overview, data of overviews of the course, to sort of the big picture of the city, I guess we are developing it, for instance, could be a really interesting actor to, to look into. Um, however, if the plan is to, is to get more accurate detailed data, uh, Circle of Gothenburg would be a collaboration partner or other sort of projects going on in the municipality or the region for that. Yep. <clears throat> One more question. Yes. Um, the last question is what would you say, what job does your model fulfill and in what? If it exists, in what situations would you use it? Like the mod, like the, the your software. Yes. What job of particular work it can help? Well, it, it, the person approaching it, what so what service uh -huh. does it provide? Uh -huh. I guess like by seeing where where the flow goes, like where they are going, like you can find which actors you want to target, or like where you start. There's Search which actors to target, uh, and I guess we can also like see identify critical flaws that contribute a lot to environmental impact uh, that you want to target uh, with your effort. And also, like we mentioned briefly, the possibility to simulate and evaluate efforts. Uh, for instance, it could be possible, um, say that you want to decrease some kind of emission to a certain percent, uh, and um, which flows to target, or you want to know which flows to target to reach that decrease. Uh, the model could help in those kinds of queries. So, uh, if you want to decrease CO2 emissions by 5%, you know that you can work with furniture and all electronics. It can sort of say, okay, then you have to decrease those flows by this and this percentage in order to reach that. Target. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Now we have time for a couple of questions. And uh, please, when you ask questions, speak up a bit. Because yesterday we had this wonderful problem that it was really warm in here. Now we've got the fans running, so then it's difficult to hear when you sit in the back row. So please, when you ask questions, speak up so that everyone can hear. There's the first question. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation and a very uh, interesting model uh, on how to understand products of environment and design uh, affect uh, our environment and society. Uh, I work at a, a local energy company here, and I, I see enormous potential of, of using a tool like this to increase uh, a joint understanding or to create a common understanding on not only the impact but also responsibilities that get to the core aspect immediately. Um, you, you, for example, you point out material flows or products being designed and how, how they affect society and how they get recycled. Often we, we, when we judge these at an LCA point of view, we assume that the responsibility is being taken at the initial point of design. And that is not the case. Um, if you uh, take the example of waste incineration, which is quite far down the waste hierarchy, uh, the waste incinerator uh, is assumed responsibility for the carbon dioxide uh, that they incinerate from waste. Uh, but they are at the end of the chain. They have very little uh, possibility to actually uh, influence design decisions at the end. Uh, we're the energy company. We assume some of that CO2 emissions in the district heating grid, which is trying to capture the energy content of the waste at the end of the waste hierarchy. Uh, but when we sell our district heating to the district heating customers, they have to carry the 
CO2 emissions from the design decision at the very beginning. And this is how we disseminate responsibility. We, 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 uh, it's it, it's, it's um, pushed down throughout the chain so that no one really uh, can assume total responsibility. And my call in life now is to try and push the responsibility up to where the decision is made. And if that could be included somewhere in this model, uh, showing how not only how the, 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 the choices are made early, but also how the responsibility is disseminated throughout the process, that would be, I think, very enlightening uh, for decision makers, uh, policy developers, uh, to see how this um, could be improved. Yeah, that's really interesting. You kind of have multiple gates of responsibility where you can find not only consumption, maybe, but also other stages. Yes, exactly. I mean, as a consumer, we say the consumers have choices, but when you go to the restaurant, you don't have any circular models available. It's all in there. Yeah. Uh, so the designers need to have proper incentives at the beginning of that chain. But there's also another aspect, and may, maybe you didn't touch on it uh, in entirely detail, but um, you made a difference between uh, local and national environmental impact. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, and it's, I'm considering especially the CO2 emissions because local CO2 emissions could have a positive effect on the system, meaning that your local emissions are going to be smaller than somewhere else. But of course, when you evaluate that, wow, the CO2 emissions in Gotham are going up, that's not a good thing. Do you understand what I'm uh, getting at? I think so. But I think that it doesn't differ like, from radio. I think like what, what you're able to do here is just to look at an area, because it can be that some flows are much bigger in the region, or like a problem in the region, because they are big. Yeah, but not not that they differ in environmental impact. Right. Actually, yeah. yeah, I misunderstood. That, that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect is actually that it, it calculates directly in the impact. Because it calculates through the life cycle. Okay, so, so you have the local CO2 mm -hmm. being emitted if you burn fuel yes. directly here. But you also need to calculate how much CO2 you emitted to produce that kilogram of gasoline. And the systemic effects. In the process. Yeah, but also if, if you're producing electricity locally and emitting yes. CO2, but you're, then you don't need to produce that electricity somewhere else at higher CO2. Because you have those the systemic effects that sometimes get missed. And Leonardo, if asked, uh, what makes developer of the model. Oh. <laughs> and also our supervisor. <laughs> Any more questions? I don't have a question, but it's uh, quite fitting. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice presentation. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I think your work uh, will be very helpful for not only the city of Gothenburg, but for many different, could be helpful for many different municipalities in Sweden, but also in the rest of the world. Definitely. Um, and uh, we'd love to, to continue the work to be a platform, test platform or case study. And I also think uh, uh, a few other cities would be interested in that to continue on the work. Um, I also think the second thing, I think it, it will be a perfect background material for uh, 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 an application in the future if we want to continue. Uh, to build on an, uh, an application to, to get funding to, to make this happen in practice. Do you think so? Yes, I think yes. <laughs> Check on that. <laughs> <laughs> and the third thing, uh, we're talking about uh, circling Gothenburg as one actor. I, I wouldn't define it as one actor, but uh, more as a, uh, like a supporting um, initiative for the whole city. Uh, so it's like an entrance, entrance uh, it, to get into the city uh, and of course in the continuum of the work we need to involve uh, experts from different administrations uh, for example the environmental administration of course and, and i think cycle government could be uh, uh, an actor <laughs> uh, to find these experts and involve them together with circular <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, so one of the aspects that uh, can be achieved 
with the model is um, looking at the trends mm -hmm. in the data. And then the way that I see that you portray that in uh, your design is that, for example, in the when you're selecting the parameters, you can select more than one year. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I understand, then in the Sankey diagram, these flows are summed yeah. for these years. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the other place that I saw trends being visualized was in the environmental impact graph. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you explored any other ways of visualizing, visualizing trends and being able to monitor actions. Yeah, actually, yeah. with the trends, we did not go to mm -hmm. But that was just to kind of show what you also could do with the data, but we did not like, explore that so much. Okay. So that could actually be elaborated in the other Okay, thank you. Any other questions, thoughts, or comments? Yeah, I can just say that the comments as well. Uh, I've been like cursor browser for a while. Um, it's been really interesting to do your work and probably from the design background, the system design process, I think you've really managed to uh, address that through your work as well. Um, I was wondering if you could just add a few thoughts on, on how have you analyzed the meaning of the system plan aspect? And I know you see how it's like on that, but um, what were the challenges of the well, when we when we started to uh, explore the needs, it was a, a bit difficult because we wanted to explore them um, separate, kind of from the universe. So, so to try and not introduce the model or this uh, kind of way of thinking of flows too much, because then we color what would come out of the interview. But then, I, uh, I don't know, I guess we sort of introduced it in, in some ways, because otherwise we would, we would just get needs, very general needs of, of their work. Um, and that was something that we had to um, sort of prioritize them, like what needs are we actually going to look at here and do something about, because there were a few of them that completely outside our scope and what you could do anything about it. So uh, time restrictions or budget restrictions or, or those kinds of things where we couldn't do anything with that. So I guess there was a trade-off in that work uh, between kind of not following the results too much but also not gathering too much irrelevant results. Yeah. So in that work, we then prioritize as well, like, <coughs> what can we do, what can't we do, and what kinds of needs could the model, like, based on our knowledge about the model, what, what needs could be addressed in different time frames, kind of, um, so see, like, how would the development of the model look, and how could that be now and in the future as well, so that's like, how we address it. Value, potential value from the model, and then the problematic things that we could develop and visualize. Sure. Do you want to go? All right. Um, yeah, first of all, I would like to say one very important thing, and your opponent mentioned that how crystal clear the report was. And, and, and that leads me to a question. Not so much on the details, uh, and also just briefly mentioning that you've done a lot of work that you even don't show people. Uh, and, and, and to that aspect, I actually think you are underestimating the work you've done, in a sense. Uh, so, so I think that's important for you to know. Uh, but but what, what leads me to this crystal clearness in the text is how easy or hard was for you to deal with the passion on the side of research, very close to the, this idea of changing the world and doing this model that you really strongly believe in it, and then also the side of circular government that also wants to change their world in, in a very practical way. And so, so there are two sides of the story where, where you see a lot of maybe not 
people are not seeing straight in a sense. <laughs> so how hard or how easy was for you to juggle around that that's expectations from, from both sides? Because I think it also is very tricky to, 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 mm -hmm. to work with this woman. Yeah. Have you thought about it? <laughs> yeah, it's, good. And, and it's a really good question. I, we have reflected a, a bit on it. Like, uh, for example, in the, standing, in the understanding of what you can actually do with the model here and now, because, and because there are a lot of visions around it, you know, what, you, what you can do. And, and it's been quite hard for us, I guess, to understand like what is the vision and what is the raw data that exists now. So actually being able to portray a true image of, of what we can do now and in a few years and then five years and ten years and so on. And um, I guess that's been one of the hard chips. Yeah, and also that it's like it's very hard because usually in design you have something that is fixed. Yeah. Like this is what we have to work with. But now we have had two parts that are both dynamic. <laughs> The model can change, circular government can change, so both can change. But like it was hard to find this uh, what is fixed in our product, like what is what is the frame? But I think that that was a bit the hardest. Mm. Yeah. And the needs that we map now, are they valid in five years? Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Most of them. We're soon, soon going to move into uh, just a coffee break. I just wanted to ask one question because you proposed in your Sankey diagram uh, an arrow that goes down in one corner and the other corner, uh, which in a sense is creating a circular Sankey diagram. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any examples of that or is that your proposal? No, there is. There is yeah. uh, certain ones. But we, because we did a bit of a, I guess, a different. I guess it could be sound a bit peculiar that it's not actually circular. It sort of goes down, stops, and then comes back up. Um, but yeah, I think that yeah. was because the thing is that when you recover a material or a product specifically, it seldom comes back into the same system. It's down cycled, it goes into another system actually. So it was more showing that, yeah, things are being recovered and things are being taken back, but it's not necessarily the same thing. Because when you create this online, you've got a lot of code that you can download, which shows this, but you can never find the outside parts. Anyhow, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, the end of the question round. Thank you. going for a 10 minute coffee break. Uh, there are many of you who were here for the last coffee break and are staying. So those of you who are new, uh, you get to go and take uh, coffee and cake first. Uh, <laughs> the, 